Good morning. I think it's about time for another COVID haircut. I don't know about you, but mine's getting a little long and wild. This time last year, I was teaching the adult class at our church and the readings on Lent. Then COVID hit and it's been one wild long year. Almost one year ago exactly, I started this YouTube channel. And I think my first videos, it was snowing outside. And today I was planning on going outside and doing a little venture. But just as I got all packed up and ready to go, it started snowing again. Here you go, let me take you upstairs and show you what I mean. I had such great plans today to go outside and film in a park, but all of those got dashed when I woke up and saw the weather this morning. Check out the weather outside. It started dumping it down just about a half hour ago. So no field trips today. It's supposed to snow like this all night too. All right, where was I? Uh, now here we are in the journey called Lent once again. And Lent is meant to be a time of self-examination, repentance, prayer, fasting, and self-denial. And I think these themes are especially significant this year, especially all that we've lost over this past year, a half million people in the United States alone. Now this should really humble us as Americans and especially those within the church. The virus should seriously impress upon us the themes of Lent, self-examination, repentance, prayer, fasting, and self-denial. All of the social isolation, denial of doing things, wearing a mask for the benefits of others, tie in strongly with the meaning of Lent. So this Lent, let's pick up our calling during this pandemic and integrate it with our practices as we seek to prepare for Easter to draw us closer to God and our journey through Lent. You're watching the Caffeinated Bible. My name is Dave, and the goal of this channel is to equip you to read your Bible in a more informed manner. So if you find these videos helpful, please subscribe and give it a thumbs up. I just finished a series on how to read Bible stories or narratives in the Bible, and today we're getting back into the lectionary readings and picking straight up here in the third Sunday of Lent. Now going back at least a thousand years, the opening prayer for this Sunday, or the introit, is taken from Psalm 25, verses 15 and 16. Oculi mei semper ad dominum. My eyes are continually towards the Lord. This Sunday's reading from the Gospel is taken from John chapter 2, the cleansing of the temple. While most Sunday's readings are taken from Mark during year B, most of the readings during Lent are borrowed from John. And I mentioned the reason for this in a video that I had on the structure of the lectionary. So let's read from John chapter 2, verses 13 through 22, the story of the cleansing of the temple, and I'm reading from the Net Bible. Now the Jewish feast of Passover was near, so Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple courts those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers sitting at tables. So he made a whip of cords and drove them all out of the temple courts with the sheep and the oxen. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, take these things away from here. Do not make my father's house a marketplace. His disciple remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will devour me. So then the Jewish leaders responded, what sign can you show us since you are doing these things? Jesus replied, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. Then the Jewish leaders said to him, This temple has been under construction for 46 years. Are you going to raise it up in three days? But Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. So after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the saying that Jesus had spoken. If we compare and contrast John's account of the cleansing of the temple with Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we notice several things. The biggest difference is that John places it at the start of Jesus' ministry. Now, a common response argue is that there were two cleansings and that each gospel chooses only to tell one of the cleansings. 
The problem is, because of the radical nature and the significance of this event, it seems highly unlikely that all four Gospels would only record one cleansing. You would expect one to make reference to at least a second cleansing somewhere, but nobody does. But if we consider plot and plot structure and narratives, the ability to shift things around within a narrative is not new and is seen throughout the Bible. In fact, as readers, we seem to like stories that break the historical flow in order to present things in sort of a little bit more creative or provocative manner. Movies do this all the time. Think of Pulp Fiction, which shifts events and storylines all over the place. A common example of this is in the Gospels when Jesus does or says something, and then the narrator will chime in and says, Jesus did or said this to signify what type of death he was going to suffer. In John 2.22, John writes, So after he was raised from the dead, and his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the saying that Jesus had spoken. Even within this story, the author jumps to the disciples' faith after Jesus was resurrected and then drops right back into the middle of this story without missing a heartbeat. And we're able to follow these temporal disjunctions without much thought at all. But in this instance, this entire story is much more pronounced. So why does John place it here and not in the final week of Jesus' life, which is when it most likely occurred? First off, the temple cleansing is a very significant event in the life of Jesus. And you could imagine what would have happened if John had admitted this. You call this a gospel? John, sheesh, you don't even include the story of the cleansing temple. How can this be a gospel? I mean, take a look at what Mark did. Now there's a gospel for you. So John needs to include this story because of its significance. But I think there's two reasons why he moves it to the beginning of his gospel. First, he wants us to see that this is central to the theology that he's arguing within his gospel. Throughout John's gospel, there is this theme of replacement. It's not that what God had done or revealed in the Old Testament was bad, but in Christ, there's something much greater present. In the story of the cleansing of the temple, we move from the cleansing of the temple then to the body of Christ. There is this replacement theme from the temple to the body of Christ. The second is, is that in the other Gospels, the cleansing of the temple is the, really the last straw that breaks the back of the camel. After this, Jesus' arrest and execution are more or less done deeds. But for John, Jesus will be crucified for theological, not so much for entering into conflict with the religious leaders. If you move further in John's Gospel to John chapter 11, when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, the Jewish leaders begin to plan how they're going to have Jesus arrested. They view Jesus as using his miracle working power to lead the people astray religiously. They're afraid that he's going to lead the people astray to worship other gods, and then this will bring God's judgment upon the nation. Throughout John's Gospel, you have the reason plainly stated why Jesus is crucified. In John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. In other words, Jesus will die because God loves the world and God will sacrifice him for us. In John 12.20, some Greeks are visiting Jerusalem and they ask Philip if they can meet Jesus. When Jesus hears about this, he replies, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly I say to you, unless a seed of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. It's when these Greeks, representing the wider world, come to see Jesus that the hour has come. This is what sets in motion the arrest, trial, crucifixion, and resurrection in John's Gospel. So, he keeps the cleansing of the temple in his Gospel, because of its significance, but he moves it to the start of his gospel because he doesn't want you to be confused with the real reason why Jesus will be crucified, because of God's love for us. There are two other major differences between how John recounts the cleansing of the temple and the other gospels. John combines the cleansing of the temple with Jesus' prediction that the temple would be destroyed. These two stories 
are separated in other Gospels, but then combined in John. And we'll get to that here in a bit in the video. The third difference is that John's account is much more dramatic. Jesus is much more forceful. He makes a whip. He drives them out along with their animal. He scatters their money and he overturns their tables. In Matthew and Mark, he drives them out and overturns the table. In Luke, it just says he drives them out. So John's description here is much more vivid. Now let's take a look here at these money changers and the animal sellers. Oftentimes you'll see interpreters or you'll hear teaching which says that the Jewish leaders were corrupting the temple. They were using it as a place for business or various things like this, or it shows the hypocrisy of the Jewish leaders. However, historically we know that the money changers and animal sellers, they were needed in order for the pilgrims to be able to worship at a feast like Passover. It wasn't practical to bring an animal a great distance or from another country. The Sanhedrin were actually very concerned about this and they sought to balance the need of the pilgrims with the physical constraints and lack of space in ancient Jerusalem. The money changers were needed since the Jewish religion did not permit images on things. So the coins from other countries needed to be changed into something which was acceptable within Israel. The tables that Jesus overturns here most likely refer to the small tables or benches that were used by bankers or money changers. These aren't like tables like this or picnic tables that were set up. These tables or benches would have been etched in the top with tables and exchange rates so that the pilgrims would know how much money to expect when they exchanged money with these bankers or these money changers. In fact, this is a good place to interject a little bit of historical linguistics to help you understand this idea here. The English term bankruptcy comes from the Latin. And in Latin, the tables that were used by money changers or money traders were called banca. If someone was found to be cheating people or their clients, the officials would confiscate their banca and then break it up, ruptero, banca rupt, referred originally to the breaking of their benches that they used to conduct their business. In essence, putting them out of business and destroying their livelihood. And this is where we get the English term bankruptcy. This is what Jesus is doing here. He's overturning these tables that had these charts and tables for converting the money. Another point I want you to realize here as we go through the cleansing of the temple in John's gospel is how artistically it is structured. This story basically breaks into two parts and each part is organized around three movements. First, there is an action, the cleansing in the first part and the demand for a sign in the second. The second movement is Jesus's words. Do not make my father's house a marketplace in the first and destroy this temple and I will raise it up again in the second. And finally, each movement concludes with Jesus' disciples remembering. So there's a high degree of structure and artistry to this account. Now in John's Gospel, it just has this reference to, you shall not make my house a marketplace. In the other Gospels, the reason why Jesus cleanses the temple is because it's interfering with worship, especially those from other countries. The quote from Psalm 66, 9 here, that zeal for my house will consume me, is something that the disciples later then used to interpret Jesus' actions here. That zeal for his father's house will consume him. This speaks ahead about Jesus' passion later in the gospel. In the second movement, the Jewish leaders demand a sign. You can understand why they demand this. Jesus is running around like a madman with a whip and overturning tables and driving people out of the temple. Of course, as the leaders of Israel religiously, they would be very concerned about what he's doing and why he's doing it. In response, the only sign that Jesus gives is that of the resurrection. And this is the central theme of the second half of this story. Jesus' reply in 2.19, destroy this temple, introduces a new theme within John. Now, John likes to pick up on concrete ideas such as temple, wind, bread, water, for example, in chapters two through four, and then use them all with a split or a double meaning. As I discussed in the video on dialogue, oftentimes in biblical stories, there's two levels of meaning, and this is on display here. 
When Jesus says, destroy this temple, they understand what he's talking about at a very literal level. In fact, the very pronoun, the demonstrative pronoun, this, would really seem to indicate that he's talking about the temple that they're in. But to understand this split reference, we need to go back to John 1.14. Now the word became flesh and took up residence among us. A temple signified the dwelling place for a deity. In John 1.14, because the word became flesh and dwelt among us, Jesus' body is the perfect house or temple in which God dwells. There's a progression here when John is referring to the temple. In 2.14, the temple refers to the outer courts or the temple complex as a whole. And the Greek word there is arion. Then 2.16 and 17, he uses the word oikos, house, to refer to the temple. And then finally, in 2.19 through 21, he uses the word nous, which refers to the actual temple building itself. You know, sort of the building that we often imagine as a temple with the portico and the pillars and stuff like that. This is what's used in 2.19 and 21. And then we move off that in 2.21 when Jesus refers to his body as the temple of God. So we see this progression where we start with the temple's outer courts and we finish with the controversy over Jesus' body that's going to be crucified and then resurrected again three days later. The reference to the temple and Jesus' body is picked up two chapters later when he's talking with the woman at the well. She asks, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you people say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus replies that a time is coming and will come when we no longer worship in Jerusalem where the temple was, but in spirit and truth. The form of worship that Jesus will open with his sacrifice on the cross, the destruction of his temple, is what he's talking about with the woman at the well. So all these stories from John chapter 2 to John chapter 4 are woven together with themes that interrelate and repeat throughout them. However, I digress. Let's get back to our story. Finally, in 2.22, the disciples remember that Jesus had said this, believed the scripture, and that Jesus said this. And this ties back into the end of the first section, 2.17, where it says, and they remembered the scripture, talking about Psalm 99, that zeal for my father's house will consume me. Jesus' cleansing of the temple is traditionally tied to the event during Jesus' final week leading up to his crucifixion. So reading this story, especially from John chapter 2, is perfectly harmonious with our readings for Lent. Jesus' zeal to protect and cleanse the temple for worship serves to challenge us during Lent. How would Jesus react to our practices, our devotion and commitment to worship? In this matter, this story calls us to repent, reflect, and change our lives during the season of Lent. Finally, in John's Gospel, it is not the cleansing of the temple that will seal Jesus' arrest and crucifixion. It's God's love for us. These two ideas of radical cleansing and consecration for worship and God's sacrificial love for us should drive our attitude, approach, and practices during Lent. Amen? Next week, we're going to pick up with John chapter 3, and we'll look at this love that God has for us and the implications of that for our lives. Till then, peace. What's out here? What's out there? You see anything? <laughs>